thanks for the very short, nice, sweet <laughs> introduction. Um, okay, good. So, yeah, congratulations, everyone, for making it to the final day. I know people are usually, I'm pretty brain dead by the final day. So, like, if you want to sleep a bit, uh, I won't take offense. Um, I don't think I'll take, like, the full talk time. So, if you want to ask questions, like, yeah, please do so. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm Amir. I'm from the University of Amsterdam in this group called QSoft, which is mostly, like, uh, theoretical computer science people. Um, so I'll avoid physics language as much as possible. And uh, the work I want to talk about today is, yeah, it's on quantum back backpropagation, but not really. I'll just define what this kind of means and uh, reusing information in a quantum circuit. And everything I will talk about came from this paper. And uh, yeah, Ravi, who's in the audience, is like uh, was working on this with, with me. And like I think he was quite instrumental to the work. And it started with uh, an internship I was doing at Google and then yeah, morphed into this paper. So we submitted it to NeurIPS and it got in, yay, but nobody at QSoft even knew what NeurIPS was, so this is a bit sad. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this is cool. So, okay, so before I explain you know, this idea of quantum backpropagation and um, some motivation for the research question and why this maybe could be interesting to you, I want to just like make sure that you know, we're all on the same page. So whenever I say something is classical or a classical model, just think neural network. Whenever I say something is quantum or quantum model, think this very bad variational circuit that I tried to draw here. Um, and in particular, like these variational circuits or these parameterized quantum models, I mean, we've heard about them all week, right? So I don't have to spend a lot of time here. But um, I just want to like, you know, for completeness, state that there are some model that depend on parameters which come to you in the circuit form, that's the parameterized operations. And um, they appear not just in machine learning or quantum machine learning. I think people care about them in other areas, which is also just a quick point I want to make. Like maybe you're trying to simulate, you know, some target state or some system dynamics and you do this variationally. Or um, I think maybe like this QAOA models kind of also care about these parameterized circuits. Maybe the output's not necessarily a, an expectation value, but there's still some notion of you know, these parameterized circuits. Um, and then, yeah, of course, like for us, quantum machine learning, right? People, 99% of, 99 of the time, at least in my interactions, when people talk about quantum machine learning, they're talking about variational circuits, okay? So long story short, if, um, by the way, I'm not, I'm not advocating that this is the case, right? That these models are expressive or interesting or should be used. I'm just saying they are used and they're quite popular. And, um, and if they are so popular and if, you know, people care about them, then, um, then we should be able to optimize them, right? Because at the end of the day, they parameterize functions and we need to figure out how to go back and tweak and train and, and optimize these parameters in an efficient way. And I'll explain what kind of efficiency we require in particular. Okay, so we need to optimize them in a smart way. Ah, okay, I wanted to ask a question, but not put the answer up. I was gonna say like, what is the leading way people, you know, usually optimize parameterized functions classically? I know you all saw the answer, so someone just say it. Gradient free methods. Okay, oh, gradient? <laughs> good, good. Gradient free methods. Yeah, okay. <laughs> gradient free methods, no, you know, I think uh, gradient based methods is, I, I guess, like the leading way to optimize parameterized functions classically, right? So, just a brief interlude on like the success of gradient based optimization in classical machine learning. Um, the only meme I will put in the paper because I like uh, the movie, Back to the Future. I think. Um, Neural networks in particular were really quite successful because we were able to optimize them with this really nice algorithm called backpropagation, right? Which I'm sure like majority of people here know a lot more about backpropagation than, than I do. But how we can think about it for the purpose of this talk is really that backpropagation is just a um, recipe or an algorithm to compute gradients of a parameterized function. And in particular, I think it was the first computationally efficient method to do this for neural networks, right? So for the purpose of neural networks, which is kind of what we care about a lot in classical machine learning, that propagation was quite prolific because it really helped us optimize them. And uh, something that Jared always likes to remind me, and he'll, he'll speak after me actually, um, is that backpropagation is not just a chain rule. So for those of you who are familiar with like, you know, the functions of neural networks and how they look, when you write out gradients with respect to every parameter, there's like a lot of repetition and redundancy in, in the gradient expression. And so people often just like make this throwaway statement that backpropagation, the efficiency of computing all these gradients, is kind of just due to the fact that the chain rule introduces this redundancy in the calculation. But it's a little bit more than that. It's also like computing a function in an elegant way such that information, intermediate information, 
is stored and reused to calculate gradients to get this efficiency, right? Okay, so I drew this, um, this timeline of deep learning, and I just wanted to highlight that, like, yeah, we, we knew about perceptrons, neural networks for a while, and it really wasn't up until the fact that we could optimize them, plus having the compute power to, like, get to scales we are today in classical machine learning, right, where we're in the order of trillions of parameters. So the fact that we can have this efficiency of backpropagation, I think, is really quite important. And I'll, I'll again, I'll... Okay, so, so what is this efficiency of backpropagation that I, I keep preaching about? So um, you don't have to worry, I guess, too much with this, you know, this algorithm of backpropagation. All that is important for what we'll talk about today is just thinking in terms of resources and how resources scale when computing gradients. So backpropagation in particular says the following. So imagine uh, you have some function, f of theta, and theta now is like your parameter vector, right? So it can be super, super large. So like if there are m parameters in your circuit, you know, this can be like trillions with neural networks. So I'm giving this parameterized function and I want to compute or estimate the gradient, which will be like a m dimensional vector, m is very large, up to some like constant precision. What backpropagation says is that the time that it will take me to compute the full gradient, right, is less than or equal to the time it takes to run the function times some constant, right? So C1 and C2 are just some, some constants here. So if you, like, process that, that's, that's actually quite amazing, right? Like, what is that saying? That's saying that the time to compute, you know, potentially, like, I don't know, trillions of gradient components takes me the same time to just, that it takes me to just run the function once, right? So, so that's quite amazing. So this is like a relative scaling of resources statement. And the same is true for memory as well, right? So I haven't said how to account for time or memory, but what's important, I think, in this slide is that, like, backpropagation allows us this relative scaling of resources. And for neural networks, these constants are known to be super small, right? Like, I mean, it's a factor of two or three. Um, okay. So does that make sense to everybody? Yes, see some nodding. Okay. Um, so no questions. Okay, good. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, if you are looking also like some like error like, at computing the gradients, will that uh, come in and increase that overhead? Um, so there could indeed be error in estimating gradients, but then it would just like kind of I'm making the assumption that it's kind of absorbed into these uh, okay. time to compute, right? So so if there's an like an error to estimate your function, there'll probably yeah also be an estimate error to yeah. Do the gradients. Um, is there anything else I want to say? Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure I get this. So the yeah. constants C1 and C2 are independent of M. That's right, yeah. In this, in this case. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this sets up like the research question now, right? Like, I mean, obviously the next natural thing we ask is, okay, well, can we achieve this very nice relative scaling and resources for these parameterized quantum models that everybody knows and loves so much and uses them? And in particular, maybe even if we, we relax this assumption that C1 and C2 have to be constants independent of the parameters, maybe like we can allow them to have some sort of like polylogarithmic dependence on the number of parameters in the model just to like, you know, get close to like something like this. Can, can this be done? And I want to just point out right now that as far as I know, all gradient methods in the literature, computing gradients for these models, do not achieve the scaling where C1 and C2 are like constant or polylogarithmic in the number of parameters, right? So this is, um, this is important, and this is something I think that's kind of just politely ignored. Um, what is the scaling yeah. linear? Um, uh, uh, it depends. I get to the... depends on your cost model, right? So, uh, which I haven't defined yet. Okay, cool. All right, so, so let's talk a little bit about why this is like a, a difficult or not, not so straightforward uh, question for us in the quantum setting. And... Um, yeah, I'm actually embarrassed now to put this because it's like a grade one example of computing gradients. But I think it's nice to just make sure, you know, we all kind of get the intuition, right? So, so imagine like you have, you have a very simple parameterized state. So you've just got like one qubit and now you're doing some parameterized rotation about some axis, right? So theta here is just a scalar value. It's just like a single parameter in your model. Um, and then, yeah, we can, we can draw the circuit for it, right? So I can explicitly write out the gradient. Of, uh, of this state. It takes a very nice, easy form, right? We just drop down this, like, minus ix. And if, let's say, the observable I want to measure in this, in this uh, 
in this function, let's say it's like the z operator, z observer, right? So if I want to write out this function f of theta, it looks like this, okay? And then I can write out the gradients, and you can kind of just um, simplify this expression by setting this, this theta parameter to zero, and, and kind of all I want to show you, this imaginary part's not so important, but all I want to show you is that, okay, in the simplified setting of writing out the gradient, setting the parameters to zero, this reduces to like estimating this expectation value, okay? Okay, so that's fine, that's for one parameter, but now when we have two parameters in our model, we can do the same thing. We can write out the gradient with respect to each parameter, gradient of our function. And then this, again, like, you know, setting this par the parameters to zero in the simplified setting reduces to, like, this um, uh, task of estimating expectation values, but with respect to operators that don't necessarily commute, right? So this gives you a sense of, like, a little bit of the nuance here because, you know, it's not very easy necessarily to estimate these things at the same time. And so, like, yeah, if we had m parameters in the model, this, this task is, you know, very close or, or similar to kind of estimating m expecta expectation values. Okay, so if that's clear, now we can move on to the cost model and how we define cost, right, so in our quantum setting. So I'm saying that if we have parameterized operations that are parameterized like, like some arbitrary uj, right, and... and uj depends on some parameter, theta j. Um, each one of these parameterized operations in my circuit and their inverse costs me one, one unit of computational time. Yeah? Okay, so usually, like in our variational circuits, we apply you know, some, a, a lot of these parameterized operations. So if I have m parameterized operations and each one of them costs me one unit of computational time, how much would it cost me to set up the state here in this uh, computational model? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually asking, like, yeah. what, what was the guess? Less than one, right? I mean, no, be. oh, sorry. So this is this notation's a bit bad, right? So, so that u of theta is equal to a product of m parameterized operations. So I'm applying m parameterized operations. Each of those cost me one in my model. <laughs> so now, what is the answer <laughs> to this very... Well, not, you, less than one. No, no, so... so uh, <laughs> okay, uh, let's... Let me say again. So I have a parameterized operation, some parameterized x rotation. That is going to cost me one unit of computation. Well, I have digitalized yeah. your cost, and there could be a smaller representation with smaller gates. Oh, are you making a joke or something that no, I don't no, understand? That oh. <laughs> <laughs> I literally allow theta j over 2, and then it's less than 1. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, then, then it's less. It could be less than 1 if you have half cost, right? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> if, you, if you do it with one theta, that's one, but imagine these are rotations, mm -hmm. and you you would say if I do uj of theta j over two has half a unit of cost, and over four has oh, a quarter. I see, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. but that's not how we uh, think about... Right, you do you want to say something? Yeah, why was that? Because if you do uh, rotations of an x gate, right, I mean, if that is a rotation in an x gate, and this parameter is t, well, if t is zero, you don't do anything, why should you give this any? Sure, but these don't have to be the same rotations, right? They I don't, know. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. So you had okay. a compiled circuit that was already too super efficient. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, but in this very, you know, basic, naive setting, uh, what is the answer, Matthias? You had a... Okay, hopefully M. Yeah, thank you. M is the right... It's a career. It's not a trick question, although there were some, some trick answers. Um, okay, so it will just cost me M in this cost model, right? So every parameterized operation, I'm assuming, costs me one unit. Um, yeah. Do you think of the single parameterized operation, these UJs, as local? Oh, no, you don't have to. In, in general, like, they can be whatever. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so, so this is our function of interest, right, our model, this f of theta, which we, we know and love, this parameterized circuit. So if I want to estimate my model, this will also cost me m in this cost model, right, because um, each parameterized operation and the inverse kind of cost me one. And then usually, you know, because we have to sample, there's like some notion of, of precision in here, but like this is not too important. Yes. You mean pi with a single parameter? Uh, it could be, yeah, you can think of it like that. It could be any observable. Well, if it's many observables. Oh? And you, yeah, if it's a sum of parallelities, then you're going to have to measure for each of those parallelities. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, then, the, then it would, if, you, if you have to like run the circuit a lot of times, yeah, I guess that would, in the naive setting, it would, Produce a bad cost. Yeah. But for now, just like just imagine the simplest case, just you know, you have some 
Z operator or whatever, yeah. And then like this would give you this cost, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So now if I wanted to write out the gradient of my function with respect to one parameter, theta k, right? I can you can kind of just you know, take my word for it that this, the expression is, uh, is like this, where it kind of looks a lot like the function itself, but then there's this partial derivative that comes in here. But to estimate this quantity now, right, also costs me m in this cost model. So it costs me like the same that it would cost me to just run the function. But the catch is that this is just for a single gradient component, right? So now to Ryan's question, if I had to naively do this sampling, to, to estimate the full gradient, I would get like a cost of m squared. And the cost of running my function is just linear in m, right? So if we go back to this like relative scaling and overhead thing that we want to achieve, the time it takes to, to estimate the full gradient scales roughly like m squared, which is like m times the time it takes to, to estimate the, the function, right? So this is, this is not great because we, we don't want this m here. We want a constant or something like poly log m. And uh, if you remember, like classically, you know, these things are roughly equal. So it was tough for me to, com to convince a computer science crowd that they should care about a quadratic to linear scaling. But uh, hopefully, like, you know, this crowd finds this a little bit more, more convincing, right? Because you might think, ah, oh, well, you know, who, ca who cares? It's not that big of a deal. But in reality, it is a big deal, right? Especially to classical machine learning practitioners. Like, if they had a quadratic scaling in parameters, there's no way we could reach the scales that we are at today. And, and Roger's talk was like a really nice um, you know, motivation for why over-parameterization is really important in classical machine learning. And so if we want to like compete with neural networks, we really have to you know, kind of look at bigger scales and scaling up our models. So the, in this picture here, what you're looking at is like if you had enough time to train um, you know, your, your variational circuit. So let's say I had a day to train a model. Um, if I could only do it with this naive like m squared scaling, which is how people currently do it with the parameter shift rule, then I could only train a model with 9,000 parameters. I mean, this is like really ridiculous, right? If we want to compare to neural networks, this, we stand no chance. Whereas if we have some notion of backpropagation or like some efficiency with backpropagation, uh, we can get into the millions. Okay. Is this a single yeah. gradient evaluation or do you actually mean like a certain number of epochs? Um, this is a single step, yeah. Yeah, the single uh, training iteration, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So there's a couple of things that one can already say about this scaling of resources, right? So there's a, a few different settings we can consider. So the first is like, imagine the input state is given to you. It's something that you, you know how to create. So like, for example, it's the, the zero state, and then you apply some parameterized operations to that. The more general setting, of course, is when you're just like given input states, so they're not known to you. So you're just given some arbitrary psi, and then you apply your parameterized operations. And then, I guess, some more restrictions you can say is like I only can have like single copy access to psi, or I can measure a tensor product of them, of the states that I have. Okay. So in these like uh, different settings, there are some results that we can already make use of. So the first one, for example, which I think you know is probably the nicest, most useful setting. It's like you don't want to really make some assumptions about the input state that you have. Um, and I think in the lab, it's easiest to measure single copies, right? So this is like probably probably the setting we want right now to work and, and exhibit backpropagation scaling. But unfortunately, in general, this is, not, um, this is not possible. And a way to see this is it comes from a lower bound, a sample complexity lower bound from this paper here. Which basically says, if you have a model, imagine you have a model, and in that model you have like parameterized Pauli operations, and you take like every possible Pauli operation you can have in your circuit, um, computing the gradients, and then in the simplified setting of setting the parameters to zero, it kind of reduces to the same problem of um, estimating these trace row PIs, where PIs are these Pauli. So long story short, the sample complexity bound tells us in our cost model that we get this bad like quadratic scaling that we don't want to see, right? So this is a bit sad. Um, and then, okay, um, the next question, I guess, is, okay, well, what if we... Yeah, sure. Of course, of course. The question about what you can... So uh, if I remember this low bound correctly, it's kind of important that you allow mixed states. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Your model arbitrary state. looks pure. Uh, yeah, because I put pure states, that's true. So, so maybe um, to answer your question, if you make some... Uh, 
some restrictions, like your state is pure and comes from a circuit of polynomial complexity, then this bound doesn't hold anymore. So are you saying when the input state is unknown that it could be a mixed input state? That's right, yeah. Mm. Okay, so like this is a nice uh, transition into Matthias's point, right? So okay, so what if like my state has some additional restrictions that perhaps make it easier for me to um, for me to get a nice efficiency or scaling? So one of those restrictions is okay. Well, what happens if my input state is known to me? So this is a bit of a, a convoluted uh, statement. So if you don't take anything away from the next couple of slides, it doesn't matter. What I want to say is that there's some like results. Um, and we also kind of iterate through known gradient methods in the paper to just show computationally it seems still very unlikely that we will achieve backpropagation scaling even when the input state is entirely known to us. But like a cool thing that wasn't immediately obvious to me at least was that if you say like let's let's make this restriction on our state. So let's say like um, let's say my state comes from a, a circuit of polynomial complexity. So so what does that mean? Well, it means that like I have a, a gate set of a certain fixed you know, fixed size, let's say like one or two qubit operations, and I create a state that consists of polynomially many operations that come from this gate, uh, this gate set, right? Um, then what can be shown is that information theoretically, you can efficiently learn this state, right? But unfortunately, computationally, in general, you shouldn't be able to like actually uh, identify or like know the circuit that, that generated the state. So it's a bit of a strange, um, strange statement. So how to see it is like, okay, well, if I have this guarantee that my state comes from this polycomplexity <laughs> circuit, there's roughly, um, there's roughly n to the p of n of them. So p of n is just some polynomial in n. So there's like exponentially many of these uh, circuits that could produce my state, right? Okay. So if I denote like every state, psi 1 to psi k, as a state that could be produced by one of these circuits, right? So there's still exponentially many of them. So I, I denote like each state that comes out of every possible circuit by phi 1 to phi k. I can use this nice classical shadows procedure to basically like estimate the fidelity with respect to every possible phi. Um, and then I can do this like efficiently in number of copies, right? So I can do this log k is like something polynomial in n. So, so that's nice, um, but you know, obtaining this, you know, you're, you're going to need to find the maximum fidelity, right? You're going to need to find the match here. Um, and obtaining that involves searching over exponentially many possible values, which, you know, naively would be very inefficient. Yeah? Okay, so then you might think, well, maybe there's like a clever, smarter way to do this search procedure. Like maybe there's a way to identify the state. And like very quickly, in general, this can't be possible. Why? because these pseudo-random quantum states are states of polynomial complexity, right? So these states are known to be hard to distinguish computationally from hard random states. So this is like really not important for what I want to say in general, but like I just thought this was like a, like a oh, okay, that wasn't so obvious kind of statement. And all it, all it comes down to is that it seems unlikely if we have, in, you know, even like some restrictions on our input state, or even if we know how to construct it explicitly, when we have single copy access, it seems really difficult to get this nice backpropagation scaling that we see. Okay. All right, cool. So this is a bit, a bit sad. But then, of course, like the last thing we can do and hope for is now what happens when we change the access model and allow for, um, for multi-copy access or multi-copy measurements, right? Which intuitively, like, it should be... Okay, maybe let's just pause here. Like, why, why is it not so straightforward with, with single copies? Um, especially if I look at my function and I look at the, the gradient expressions, there's so much overlap, right? There's so many, like, operations. If you remember, these, these u thetas are, like, um, products of, of parameterized operations. So, you know, you would think, like, backpropagation classical neural networks do, they, they reuse a lot of these re repetitive um, calculations. So if we have that here in the setting... Why is it not so straightforward? Does anyone want to take a guess? It's like also not a trick question. It's, it's, it's very, very easy to see, right? Hey, what's it? No cloning? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point, indeed. Like, that's, uh, that's important. And also, like, the fact that we measure, right? And then we lose all our information. So if we want to, like, try and track the path of a function, it's not very easy because how do we, how do we extract that information in, in the intermediate part of the circuit? Yeah? So the intuition of why multi-copy access should like help us in this you know, goal of trying to do better 
is that, of course, like maybe we can design measurements on tensor product of copies such that we don't disturb our copies too much, and we get some information out, and then we can reuse them. Right? So we can hopefully try and get gradient information out at each like, measurement step and not disturb our states in memory too much. Okay. And drawing on like, a ton of inspiration from stuff that was mentioned you know, this week and all these learning separations of when you have multiple copies now, these, these, you know, these things become interesting things become doable. Okay, so the first nice uh, result, which also follows immediately from like, some work of Robert, and others is that in this special setting where you, you imagine your um, operations are Pauli's, right? So the parameterized Pauli operations. Then you, and you set your parameters to zero when you compute gradients. So it's like a very simplified setting. But then you can use a scheme that um, makes multi-copy measurements and gets a scaling in line with backpropagation so that, that, that I defined before. So this is like, okay, this is nice. We can do it. So, you know, there is something interesting to adding more, uh, more copies. But as soon as we, matter? yeah. Does it matter whether you know the input set here? Or? Um, no. No, it doesn't. Yeah. No, it doesn't, right? Yeah. Yeah. But by restricted, you mean all the thetas are zero? Yeah. All right. yeah. <laughs> um, after you like, you know, when, when you want to evaluate the gradients. Yeah. OK. OK, so yeah, as soon as we move away from this, like our thetas are not zero anymore, or we don't have you know, just Pauli's, unfortunately, the scheme doesn't work anymore. So you have to then start questioning like, what's going on here? How hard is this gradient problem, right? Um, OK, so I think this was like, quite nice. Um, turns out there's like a nice connection between this task of, of estimating these gradients and uh, shadow tomography, which we've heard a lot about. But I don't think anyone actually defined the shadow tomography problem this week, right? Like explicitly. Oh, no, Srinivasan did, I guess. Okay, but I'll just say it very quickly again for completeness, right? So in shadow tomography, I think the problem's quite simple. Like imagine we're dealing with just two outcome measurements, yeah? And we're given some copies of some unknown input state, psi. And we know, like, measurements we want to make with respect to our input states. So there are m of them, and m can be very, very large, right? So the task of shadow tomography is to output some estimates such that they're close to these expectation values that I want for all of these measurement operators, right? And do this in particular with as few copies of your state as possible. Okay, so that's the, that's the problem here. I want to make all these measurements, but I want to minimize the number of copies that I use. Okay. So there's this nice connection where one can basically show that if we have an algorithm to estimate all the gradient components, um, in some runtime, then this will give rise to a shadow tomography algorithm or protocol that can um, solve this task, the shadow tomography problem, with respect to a certain class of observables, which we call polytime observables, um, with the same runtime. Right? So, so what is it saying? It's saying that like, solving the gradient problem, or like in the way we define it, is as hard as solving the shadow tomography problem with, this, with respect to this class of observables. And this class of observables, I think you can think of it as like, a Pauli oper local Pauli operator sandwiched by U, U dagger, where you use like some fixed circuit, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, good. If I, if I make any mistakes, you correct me, Ravi. Okay, um, okay so, so there is this connection, right? And we know that the shadow tomography problem is like quite well studied now in quantum info theory, I think. Um, and how we do this is just like we define a little bit more of a general model, which we call a quantum neural network. The details are, I don't think, so important, but like, then what one, what one can do or what can wonder is like, okay, well, if there's this connection between shadow tomography and the gradients, is there something known from shadow tomography that we can borrow to make our gradient protocols more efficient in some sense, right? And the answer is yes. Um, so we, we like have this explicit algorithm that kind of produces estimates for our gradients um, such that it uses a number of copies that is in line with our backpropagation scaling. And that's all I really want to say here. So I'll give you like a high level overview of how this algorithm works or looks. Um, but this is cool because I think this is like the first proposal that gets close to something, um, you know, something like a, like a cons close to constant relative overhead. Yeah. Um, okay, but there's a huge catch. Um, this huge catch, catch is requires exponential um, classical memory. Though. So like memory that scales in the exponentially in the size of your system. So this is a bit, a bit unfortunate, right? So, so even though it like, yeah, it kind of succeeds in the, in the time complexity, the, the memory is still pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. 
So um, here as well, you need entangled measurements. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I just ask because usually the motivation for these quantum neural networks is that they're maybe NISCI, but, but that would not be NISCI. Um, yeah, I guess so. I don't know how hard these entangled measurements are to make in the lab. No. Are they, are they, they qu I get the sense they're quite hard. I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone know? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, sure, yeah. Could you go back one? Like, like the samples you need is, is poly log n, but the time should be Yeah, yeah, the time, is in, the time is in here, right? So that there's like a hidden m? There's an m here, yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't avoid this. Yeah, Matthias, do you have a, another question? Well, I think it was the same question. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I realize this like notation is a bit misleading at times because it does hide uh, m in there. But, yeah. Anyways, yeah, sure. Classical time. Um, is there like post processing? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, it doesn't. Right? Like, there's still like some problems with updating it, with classical time. There's still some other. Yeah, so, so this is like the resources is linear in the, in the quantum. quantum costs, mm -hmm. but you need like on the side an exponential mm. classical. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I say like classical resources, so, so not just memory, but like, yeah, you have to use this online learning scheme, which I think can be problematic, yeah. And, and here's the picture of why, right? So, so here's the, um, the proposal for like our, our algorithm. And um, so you basically start with some copies in memory, and you apply some operations, and then you do this like really interesting threshold check, which uses the sigma here. Sigma you can think of as like a guess for your state that exists in a classical computer. So this is where the exponential uh, memory comes in, right? Because you have to explicitly store a full density matrix on a classical computer. And you use this density matrix to kind of check if the true expectation value you want to estimate is close to the expectation value using your sigma, using your hypothesis state. And if those things are close, then great. You don't disturb your copies in memory, and you can like kind of proceed and repeat and like get more information out. If those things are far apart, then you destroy your copies in memory, you measure, and you get some information out to update your hypothesis state, and then you use a fresh batch of copies. So in this way, you can kind of like, you know, analyze and bound how many copies you would need, and that's how we kind of show that we get a scaling that's close to, to what we want. Uh, yeah, Casper. The, the fact that you get backpropagation, is this in any way specific to the architecture of the neural network, or Absolutely. is it just because we have many copies? Um, it's a combination of both. I think having the architecture in the way it is is super important, because then in between these threshold checks, you can like rotate your states in memory at unit cost, essentially. Like, so this is, this is the one thing that's kind of different to the sh current shadow tomography protocols, is like we have these like rotations in between. That makes it a bit special. Like, yeah. um, okay, cool. So that was like uh, everything I wanted to say. So if you want to take a couple of um, things home, well, like the first thing is like, okay, well, when I'm in the setting of my input state is known and I have single copy ac access, there's like computational arguments that suggest that backpropagation scaling is like not going to work. We know through inf information theoretic um, arguments that in, po in general it's not possible when we're when the input state is completely unknown, right? And we have single copy access. And then this multi-copy access thing is a little bit weird because it's like a nice result in, in quantum resources, but then like memory and also classical post-processing like comes in. So that's a bit unfortunate. Um, okay, but you know, as a researcher, there's like this leaves a little bit of opportunity for us, right? Like, I mean, um, you can then start asking some question like, okay, you know, what's the, what's the true like, you know, computational um, complexity of this problem? Um, and I think there were like some papers that came out about shadow tomography that maybe addressed this question. But maybe more realistically for us, like, are there special cases of these parameterized models that perhaps exhibit nice scaling, like that propagation scaling we want, and still um, are expressive or interesting in, in certain ways? Or maybe, and I think this is a general theme of this week, maybe it's time we consider other types of models for quantum machine learning. Um, and yeah, maybe also different methods for optimization. So I think someone was working on a coordinate descent of variational circuits, um, who I'd really like to talk about, because I think there were some interesting results there that showed that this worked well. So maybe, yeah, maybe it's time for us to use something, something more sophisticated or, yeah. 
Oh, and one last thing I want to say, um, since it's a machine learning conference, these cats are very sweet and cute, and um, they need a home, and they're here in, in LA, and so if you are willing to adopt them, please let Katerina or yeah myself know. <laughs> They're very, very well-behaved cats, even though they're from LA, and they just like uh, <laughs> they sit in their cat tree most of the day. But they also like playing if you want to play with them. And they're still quite young; they're like two years old. So please adopt them, somebody. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>